Today, uh, I, uh, I, I owed you a talk because I was supposed to speak last January and some of you kindly came to hear me and, and discovered that I looked uh, a, a lot like uh, Stu Gordon at that point. Uh, I, I, I was uh, lying on my living room floor with a, a herniated disc. Uh, it, it is all gone. Uh, it, it's the particular condition that I had is the kind that heals itself. It's like a sports injury. You have it and then it fixes itself. So knock on wood. Uh, I, I spent the summer wandering around Spain and Lebanon, so I'm fine. No complaints. Uh, but I owe you a talk. And uh, while I was... Uh, um, while I was off duty, um, uh, our field of study uh, shrank because about a fifth of Pakistan is now gone. Uh, and I thought that that's, uh, although it seems to have passed relatively without notice uh, in, uh, in the United States uh, and even to some extent continental Europe, uh, I thought uh, w we would notice it. And so I wanted to talk about that today. And, uh, of course, catching history on the run, which now has become one of my full-time occupations, is, um, uh, yes, I have more than one full-time occupation, um, uh, which Mrs. Cole complains about. Catching history on the run is a, uh, is a tough uh, thing to do. Uh, and moreover, you know, to properly study a flood, you'd have to have different skills than the ones that I have. Uh, but uh, what I was interested in talking about today was what I see as the, the, the ways in which the great deluge of 2010, which is really, if not an unprecedented historical event, because, you know, history is very long and uh, there have been previous uh, deluges, um, but still unprecedented in the modern history of Pakistan, uh, and, uh, and how it has played out uh, with regard to internal politics, external politics, uh, what it tells us about the position of Pakistan in the contemporary world. Um, so, uh, and I will play you a couple of clips as well. Uh, the monsoons uh, caused this flood. Uh, of course, the monsoons come every year, and uh, people would be disappointed if they didn't, uh, since they farm from the... the uh, the rain that comes. But this year uh, they weren't so grateful because they got way too much water. Um, as I understand it, in this part of the talk, you know, go do your own research uh, with the meteorologists and the climatologists and so forth. But as I understand it, there are two jet streams in, in each hemisphere. A, they call them a polar and a, and a tropical one because one is in closer to the uh, pole and the other is closer to the equator. But they're not really polar and tropical uh, in the northern hemisphere. There's one that goes through Toledo, Ohio, uh, which uh, I think of as my jet stream because uh, when it goes a little north, uh, we get uh, Caribbean weather, and when it goes a little south, we get Siberian weather. So I'm very interested in that jet stream. That wasn't the one at issue, however. The subtropical, uh, uh, the, 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 yes, the subtropical uh, jet stream in the northern hemisphere is the one that goes through Mexico and then it goes around and goes through Pakistan, uh, ordinarily. Well, something caused it to be blocked and pushed it far north all summer. And this had two great effects that we heard about in the news without it usually being connected, which was that the forests around Moscow got dry and hot and burned. Uh, and it was in the 90s in Moscow, which is apparently uh, as if it were in 130s here in Michigan. Uh, for the Moscovites, this was a hard summer. It's not that there have never been forest fires before around Moscow. There have been lots, but uh, th this, the intensity of it and the, uh, the, the heat and the dryness of the air and so forth um, was unusual. And that was because of this jet stream being so far north. It kind of had a kink in it. It was blocked and it was pushed. But the other thing that happened was that because it was so far north, it drew all the, the water-laden air from the uh, Indian Ocean up into northern Pakistan. And of course, what's going to happen is when that air hits the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush, that the air over those mountains is colder, causes precipitation. So it just dumped it 
on Gung, uh, 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 Gilgit, Hunza, uh, uh, Swat, and so forth, um, and which is why the air that got to Moscow was so dry and caused forest fires. So um, we are warned by the climatologists not to try to link individual events to global warming or climate change because uh, um, weather, weather and climate are two different things. So they don't work necessarily together. You can have a, a very strange climate event that uh, or weather event that has, says really nothing about climate. Uh, climate is a long-term phenomenon. However, even the climatologists are saying, in this particular case, it's pretty clear that global warming is implicated in what happened to Pakistan because there was just so much water in this air. And the reason there's so much water in the, in the air is that it, there's 4% more water vapor in our atmosphere than there used to be, and that is because of global warming. Uh, the, the temperature of the, uh, the surface temperature of the oceans is just higher uh, by a percentage or so. Uh, it causes more water vapor. So uh, the, the other question is whether that uh, kink, the, that blockage that forced the jet stream north had anything to do with climate change, and on that there's less consensus, although some believe it among the uh, scientific community. Uh, others are looking at sunspots. Uh, well, uh, if it's true that this weather event is in fact connected to climate change, uh, then that is very bad news because, uh, for several reasons. First of all, it may mean that Pakistan is in for further deluges. Uh, and nobody would want to go through again what happened in, in August and early September. Uh, and uh, the, the other thing um, is that mm, we may all be in the same boat as Pakistan. So mm, that Huron River that looks so nice and calm right now, I'm suspicious of it all of a sudden. So those floods started in, in, in late uh, I'm sorry, in, but, uh, why is that like that here? Um, catching history on the run sometimes causes you to make errors. So um, by, by in late July, uh, the floods had, uh, had started, and uh, by July 31st, you'd already had significant damage. Uh, they cut uh, Gilgit and Hunza off from the rest of Pakistan. Uh, they were violent floods. They uh, uh, apparently destroyed a, a part of the Karakoram Highway into China, so it cut Pakistan off from the east. Uh, then they washed down into, uh, the, uh, into, into Pakistani Kashmir, uh, and hit Muzaffarabad, uh, and then they washed into the Malakan district and, and the Swat Valley, um, which, uh, and they affected parts of uh, the Northwest Frontier Province, which the Northwest Frontier residents ha have through their uh, assembly renamed Khyber Puktun Khwa. I have entertained the gravest doubts that this particular name will survive for that province. It has way too many chaz in it. Uh, but uh, so it, 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 it hit some towns in, in Khyber Pukhtun Khwa, uh, in Noshera and so forth. And, and the poor people of Mulakand, you know, this has been the site of the rise of the Pakistani Taliban, uh, Tehrik uh, Taliban Pakistan, uh, who took over uh, much of Molokand uh, in 2007-2008, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Obama administration managed to convince the Pakistani army to wage a military campaign against them in this civilian district. So it, it really was like our civil war, you know, where they were fighting around Manassas, Virginia. I mean, people live there. It displaced two million people. It destroyed buildings, schools, and so forth. And so over the past year, people in the Mullican District and Swat Valley and so forth have gradually been coming back and getting into their homes again and trying to rebuild the schools that were destroyed by artillery because the Taliban were hanging out in them. And then now 
they're displaced again. Uh, I mean, really, tens, hundreds of thousands of people had to flee to Peshawar, which is a little higher, and are in, in, even now in, in tent cities uh, around Peshawar. Uh, and a lot of the Swat Valley is underwater. Um, so it was a one-two punch for that population. Uh, this is Noshera in uh, the northwest frontier. I'm say, calling it that until I have to stop. Um, this is Muzaffarabad in Azad Kashmir in the Pakistani side of Kashmir. I don't know. Maybe the Indians and the Pakistanis will fight, stop fighting over it if that's all it is. Um, Mangora is the major city in, in the Swat Valley. Uh, that, that's it. Uh, it's lower parts of it underwater. Already as of July 31st, there were 800 dead, 45 bridges out, 3,700 home, homes swept away, a million people affected. Uh, and those numbers are not correct. Um, there, far more than 800 people died in that, but how would you count them under these circumstances? And uh, they were, the, the one million affected were saying, well, come and rescue us, we need helicopters. I mean, there were people on top of those roofs uh, who couldn't get away. And uh, the government says, well, we don't have very many helicopters, you know. Uh, and uh, so uh, a lot of people were stuck. Uh, the civilian government was widely seen as uh, completely ineffective. This was a heck of a job brownie moment for Prime Minister Gilani. Uh, but the army did swing into action. Uh, and by uh, the late July, 30,000 troops had been committed in the Northwest. Uh, and they had already rec rescued 17,000, 17, although, mind you, that's a small number of the ones that needed rescuing. Uh, uh, Army Chief of Staff General Ashfaq Kiani visited the flood areas early on. Uh, he uh, visited Noshera and Swat. Uh, he issued directives to expedite relief and rescue activities. He rescued 17 persons in his own helicopter. Um, and there's the army saving a baby. Uh, I, I rather fear that that picture will be the poster for the next coup. <laughs> because there isn't any picture like that of Prime Minister Gilani saving any babies. Um, so here I want to show you uh, a, uh, a clip, or part of a clip. It wasn't the rain that flooded large parts of Sindh province, but the flood waters that oh, surged sorry. down the Wrong Indus one. River from the north. The waters took more than uh, I wanted to start with this one. This is the Nubian Valley on Wednesday. These exclusive pictures show for the first time how this tranquil location in the heart of the Swat Valley is in This is Swat in the north. Wave upon wave storming through the gorge. The river Swat and the buildings on the banks unable to cope with the strain. This is one of many popular tourist locations. Bewildered holiday makers look on. The homes and hotels which run alongside this stretch of waterway are like many buildings across the northwest, victims of Pakistan's worst rains for over 80 years. No one here is safe. An evacuation of the area was ordered by officials late on Wednesday. The thousands of people are stranded, surrounded by water, with all routes of escape blocked. It's estimated 4,000 tourists are here, as well as thousands of local residents. Riverside hotels and this, the local hospital, are immediately evacuated. The infrastructure of Median town is crumbling, swallowed up by the torrents of water. No one and no thing is safe. During the military operation against Taliban fighters in the Swat Valley these past few years, it was estimated that rebuilding the tourism industry and rehabilitating the local population would cost billions of dollars. It's hard to estimate what it will cost now, though some experts are suggesting six to seven billion in the Swat Valley alone. 48 hours on, with little food, water and shelter, the military helicopters arrived to take the survivors to save the ground. Their ordeal at an end. <coughs> It's been terrible. I served my son, but the military left him in my village. My mother, my five sisters, nieces and sister-in-law are still stuck there. 
I want the military to go rescue them now before it is too late. This picture of natural destruction is repeated across the region and now in parts of the Punjab province to the east, with many areas still cut off. Rescue efforts are stretched to the limit and the military are working around the clock. The picture is looking bleak. Aid agencies are apparently setting up camps in and around the affected areas, but the emergency is not over yet. A new storm front is predicted to hit on Monday evening into the early hours of Tuesday morning. And if it does, it will bring even more chaos to a devastated region. The Hill Raman, Al Jazeera, Mingora, in the Swat Valley. Um, that's dated August 2nd. That looked pretty bad. That was just the beginning. This thing was like one of those Hollywood disaster movies where, you know, you lose an entire continent and you think, well, nothing worse than that can happen. And then the next thing that's lost is the hemisphere. Um, so uh, uh, this is an image of uh, people getting aid in Noshera in the uh, in Northwest uh, on August 6th. Um, one of the one of the things the Pakistani government and international uh, actors were afraid of was the ways in which the Pakistani Taliban might take advantage of this uh, disaster in various ways. Uh, because, of course, there is a lively insurgency going on in the Northwest in the tribal areas as well as parts of the Northwest um, frontier or Khyber Pukhtunkhwa. Uh, and um, the, uh, there, there is evidence of uh, uh, militant linked charities, uh, Falahe and Saniyad is one of them, uh, that set up uh, uh, relief camps, uh, provided shelter provisions, uh, medical help. Uh, Falahe and Saniyad is said to have helped 20,000 people per day, which is way more than the army or the government was said to have helped. I don't know if that is true. Uh, 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 they are linked to the lashkar e taiba which is um, a, a, a very uh, militant uh, a Punjabi terrorist group uh, that appears to have been behind blowing up Mumbai uh, uh, in, uh, in fall of 2008. Uh, so not good news if they are getting street cred, if they are, if they are uh, establishing uh, patterns of patronage and, and, and gratitude uh, among that uh, population that's displaced. And then, you know, the question is where are they getting all that kind of money and uh, that they are organized, we know. Uh, but um, uh, it, it's not a question that I can answer, maybe from the Gulf. Now, Asif Ali Zardari, by the time the monsoons had started to come, had a mm, popularity rating in Pakistani polling of 20%. I don't know if George W. Bush ever quite got down to that, but this is low. He is not popular. Uh, and um, he managed to damage his standing. Um, he, uh, 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 on August 1st, uh, in the midst of that, that clip I showed you is from August 2nd, right? So this stuff was going on then. He decides to go to France to visit his chateau in Normandy and uh, to meet with uh, French President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy uh, and uh, his lovely wife, uh, uh, Carla Bruni. Uh, and I, I would keep Carla away from Asif Ali if, if I were in charge. But um, <laughs> uh, in any case, um, this, this visit, uh, and there were rumored champagne feasts at the chateau and so forth, you know, as Donald Rumsfeld would have said, didn't present good optics uh, back in Pakistan with these thousands and thousands of people being displaced and, and suddenly homeless and without uh, aid and food. And then Zardari went on to a state visit to the UK where he met with Prime Minister David Cameron. Uh, David Cameron, also not popular in Pakistan, because in late July, he made a visit to India. And while in India, said that Pakistan would have to make a choice between supporting terrorism and being accepted in the international community. 
And while the Pakistan government is, supported, is accused of supporting terrorism all the time, it's usually done behind closed doors by heads of state and not while on Indian territory. Uh, and so this uh, statement of Cameron ha caused a firestorm uh, in the Pakistani press uh, and uh, Zardari met with him uh, and said that he wanted to improve relations. Uh, so again, not a popular move on Zardari's part. Um, and then uh, he uh, 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 set up a Pakistan People's Party, the party that he heads, a uh, conference in Birmingham, a congress of the, of the par of party's supporters among the UK uh, uh, Pakistani British uh, residents. Uh, and uh, he appears throughout this visit seems to have been trying to put forward uh, his son Bilawal, uh, you know, as a more open heir apparent. And um, you know how in Nevada, Harry Reid is having trouble getting reelected as a senator and his son is running for governor and how there isn't anything in the governor's press materials about his relationship to uh, Harry Reid. Well, uh, Bilawal should study this uh, particular situation. Um, so they set up this party congress of the PPP and uh, they were PPP supporters who were there and one of them threw shoes at Zardari. Uh, unfortunately, the only thing I could find was, and I think it may be the only thing that exists, was this clip of him uh, ducking, so you can't see it very well. There is a, uh, I, I thought about showing it, but I thought it's a little frivolous for today, a, a, um, a, a Punjabi rap remix of the shoe throwing, uh, uh, which uh, <laughs> is, is, is quite entertaining. Um, that uh, incident of the shoe throwing, of course, Geo and the satellite uh, uh, channels, news channels, wanted to show it in Pakistan, and, and, and they have, of course, offices on the ground. In Pakistan, the government insists that they go through the uh, ground cable. Uh, so um, uh, the, the, they were censored. Uh, the government put enormous pressure on the news organizations not to show the, the, uh, the, the shoe whacking of uh, Zardari. Uh, and, um, uh, and actually, PPP uh, uh, party workers attacked the offices of uh, GEO in, in, in one uh, city because they had shown it. Uh, so uh, there was a recrudescence over this crisis of the floods and the poor uh, uh, reputation of Zardari, the sinking reputation of Zardari on down from 20%. Uh, it, it, it began to have an impact on the shape of Pakistani democracy because now the press is being interfered with. Now Zardari argues that, um, that he's, he's being treated unfairly, um, uh, that um, in fact the Pakistani parliament withdrew with the encouragement of the Supreme Court, withdrew from the president his status uh, as head of state uh, uh, a, a, and most of his powers so that he, you know, is a figurehead now uh, and uh, rather like the Indian president uh, and that he wouldn't be ordering troops to go save people or he, he doesn't have any executive power and so what does it matter if he's at his chateau in Normandy? Uh, and while his description of his status as a figurehead is correct, uh, wouldn't the figurehead be the one that visited the refugees in the t camps? I mean, wouldn't that be the, the function of a figurehead? I mean, uh, we had a uh, uh, treasury secretary under the, the, in the first term of Bush, Paul O'Neill, who had been uh, a CEO of uh, uh, Alcoa Aluminum and wasn't used to being in government, and he would just like disappear for a while and the press would, would want to know where was the sec tre Treasury Secretary, it's an important post, and, uh, and uh, O'Neill was quoted as saying, well, I'm just constantly amazed that anybody would care where I am. Uh, so Zardari appears to have the same attitude, um, and I don't think his self-defense went over well. Now the floods advance on having hit the Northwest advance on the Punjab itself, the southern Punjab. 
Uh, interestingly, this flood was a, a rural disaster in Pakistan. It's, it managed to mainly miss all the major cities. So Islamabad, Rawalpindi, Lahore, Peshawar, uh, Hyderabad, Karachi, uh, where uh, probably a, a, a about 40% of the population lives, uh, were, were unaffected in the sort of the new urban middle class and so forth. They, they were not the ones who were hit. It was the poorest people. Of course, this is not entirely an accident because where can the poorest afford to live is near rivers which flood. So, you know, that, uh, th they were kind of forced into that position. Although, to be fair, uh, it, it is also the case that the rivers haven't been flooding. Uh, in the 90s and early zeros, there were long years of drought in Pakistan. Uh, and um, uh, I have friends who are from Sindh and visit frequently, and they said the last time they were in Sindh, the, the Indus River was this little creek, you know, you could cross it on foot. Uh, and it's sort of like the Jordan River in, uh, in, in Jordan and, and, uh, and Israel. Uh, so um, uh, it hasn't been an ordinary thing for the Indus to be so swollen, even in the monsoon season. So 750,000 people were evacuated from Muzaffargarh uh, district in southern Punjab on August 9th, and then much of it went underwater. Um, you can see the satellite photo before here. Uh, and the magnitude of, of, the, of the flooding, the swollenness of the Indus itself, and also the overflow. Um, one BBC correspondent said that Pakistan was, uh, many parts of Pakistan were beginning to look like an inland lake. Like they suddenly have Lake Michigan when they didn't have it before. The United Nations called for an international response. Usually when the United Nations does this, there is one, uh, but this time, not so much. It's a little puzzling. Uh, donors were unwilling to give very much or even to pledge at all. Uh, and uh, why was this? Uh, Ban Ki-moon went to Pakistan and said it was the worst disaster he'd ever seen in his life. Uh, but there was very little response, not no response. Um, the UNO appeal for aid was stage-wise, so they said, well, you know, we need a certain amount of money immediately, we need another amount of money over the next three months, and then long-term, you know, we need a certain amount. And uh, the immediate money wasn't coming in in the right amounts, and the, the three-month money was very undersubscribed. And then we went to $480 million over three months. $480 million? Don't those stealth jet planes that the Pentagon is making cost a billion each? I mean, they couldn't come up with that. Uh, in the end, the U.S. has altogether pledged 200 million, but that's not the immediate amount. And, they, and, and, uh, and 50 million of that was taken from money already appropriated for reconstruction aid to Pakistan, so it wasn't even new, new money. Um, and, uh, um, and then the media blew this story off. Like, there are three speeds for our cable news television networks. There's, eh, happened a long way away and doesn't seem to be very interesting. Uh, so that's, you know, the stories about local politics in Indonesia or something. And then there's, well, it seems to be a fairly important story. We'll, we'll mention it every two hours or so, maybe have a report on it during the day. And then there's, wow, this is a story, and we'll cover it 24-7. And in fact, you won't be able to find out about anything else during the time that this story is going on. And that was the tsunami in, in 2005 or the, the Haiti uh, earthquake. It was a wall-to-wall -wall story. Myself, I would have thought the inundation of a fifth of Pakistan, the affect the way in which this affected 20 million people, the displacement of 8 million, that that was a wall-to-wall -wall story. Actually, it seems to have been treated in the third tier, like challenge mounted to governor of Sumatra. Uh, I can't, not that that's not important, but I can't understand why uh, it was slotted in that way. Of course, you could say it's expensive to cover, it's, it, it's a flood, and so it, 
you know, it, it's all over the country. It's, it's not, a, uh, uh, not an easy co uh, story to cover. But what makes me suspicious is that CNN actually sent Sanjay Gupta out to cover the flood. And he did cover it. And he submitted stories. And I don't think very many of them got on. And the ones that did get on got on, you know, Sunday night at 8 o'clock and things like that. Uh, so um, I, I don't think the producers were interested in this story. I can't entirely explain it. Uh, some people think it has to do with Islamophobia, that, you know, it's true they were flooded and 20 million people were affected and, and so forth, but, you know, they are Muslims. Um, that that kind of thinking was going on. Uh, th there is some thinking that people were unsympathetic because the, the Pakistani government is so corrupt that they, they were afraid the money would just disappear if they gave it. And it is true that, you know, all those billions that were given to the Afghan refugees in the 80s and 90s, mm, I don't know how much of it got through, but not, not what the aid donors would have wanted. Um, a USAID official once told me a story. I don't know if it's true, but he, this is what he said. I, he was briefing me at the embassy when I was giving a talk. And um, he said that the, the Swedish government had wanted to build an airport in Baluchistan. And they approached the Pakistani government. And I don't know, this was years ago, maybe under Zia or something. And uh, they approached the Pakistani government and w would they be willing to take the money and build the airport? And uh, the Pakistani government said, sure, it would be nice to have an airport in Balochistan. Uh, and so the, the Swedes gave a tranche of money every year for five years and asked for reports on the construction, which they got and so forth. And then at the end of the five years, sent out an inspector to see the airport. So there were people who were afraid that this flood relief would be a repeat of the, of, of the Baluchistan airport fiasco uh, and not a completely uh, uh, un, unfounded fear. So what happened was that the aid that's gone in, uh, uh, only 20% of it has gone to Pakistani government agencies. 80% uh, of it, you know, Oxfam and others, they're just doing it themselves. They don't want to, to go through the, the Pakistani government. Um, Others have said, well, this, you know, this, this flood unfolded over time. It was over a month, and so you know, uh, uh, it, it didn't have the immediacy of an earthquake. But I, I don't buy that story. I mean, it was serial inundation of entire provinces. I think this is something that, you know, it, it has a dramatic tension anyway. Um, and then uh, there are all these questions about whether the Pakistani military uh, is backing uh, the, uh, some elements of the Taliban and the lashkar e taiba the terrorist groups, uh, and that that just made it uh, an unsympathetic object, uh, object of uh, donor support. Um, uh, there were no, and it's been argued that precisely because the, the media in the United States didn't make this a wall-to-wall -wall story, Therefore, people didn't know about it. Uh, and it's, it's an odd thing. You know, cable news is not that widely watched. Its top shows get, you know, two million viewers, and most of the time it's like half a million. But somehow it manages to be a, 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 an echo chamber and to get stories going. So the water cooler gossip or whatever it is uh, is fed in through the cable news. So if they don't cover something, it's not a big story. Uh, so the U.S. public, I think, mostly didn't know what was going on uh, or the extent and, and magnitude of it. There were no rock concerts, still have not been, to my knowledge, for the victims. Although this disaster affected more people, was a greater disaster than the tsunami and the Haiti earthquake combined. Uh, and uh, yet there's been no response. They had... Uh, even tennis sports events uh, were, were done on a pro bono basis for Haiti uh, to, to raise money. Nothing like that happened. So by August 17th, only 20% of the immediate aid asked for by the UNO had actually been donated. You can see that the U.S. is among the largest donors, uh, but uh, a lot of countries that usually are quite generous uh, in these circumstances uh, really haven't given much. Uh, and the other thing that puzzles me is that for countries like Australia uh, or the NATO states uh, uh, and the UK and the US, France and so forth, 
Pakistan is a military ally uh, in fighting, you know, Golbuddin Hikmet Yar and, 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 and other insurgents in Afghanistan. So this happened not to an obscure, out of the way, unknown country, but to a country which is an active military ally. Uh, the Pakistanis gave the U.S. a base at Jacobabad. Uh, and so it's even more puzzling that people would say, oops, well, that's too bad. Um, then India offered aid to Pakistan um, uh, in two forms. They offered $5 million uh, in disaster aid. They also offered, since Pakistan had announced that it didn't seem to have helicopters for this purpose, India would be perfectly happy to supply helicopters for, for the aid uh, work. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories in Islamabad and uh, they already think they have the black helicopters uh, flying over Karachi and uh, they, they really were not eager for Indian helicopters in Pakistan. So uh, they, they d I think they didn't know what to do about this offer of, the, of, of aid and so they just didn't say anything. They kind of pretended it hadn't happened. And so after about a week, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh called up Gilani and said, well, you know, we did make you an offer. <laughs> Would you like the money or not? And uh, then President Obama was, uh, was dragged into it and kind of put pressure on the Pakistanis to say, yes, you know, take the money, be nice to India. They're being nice to you. Uh, and uh, seems to be poor Obama's uh, place in life to try to um, have people make nice with one another. Uh, so, uh, so in the end, Gilani did accept the money, but not the helicopters. And uh, uh, I, I mean, this is a historic event, you know, for India to give aid money to Pakistan. Uh, it, it, it's not the act of someone who's actively at war with you. And uh, so I suppose it's a kind of demarcation. In Manmohan Singh's mind, at least, India is not at war with Pakistan. Um, it was initially announced that uh, Nawaz Sharif, and these are stock photos, by the way, they didn't actually meet. Uh, uh, the, the, the Nawaz Sharif, uh, the leader of the Muslim League, which is sitting in the opposition benches at the moment, uh, would cooperate with the Pakistan People's Party in, in getting up a uh, uh, a reply to this disaster, and that is important uh, because, for instance, the, the Muslim League controls the province of Punjab, so anything done to help the people of Muzaffargarh in southern Punjab would have to be done jointly between the federal government dominated by the Pakistan People's Party and uh, the Muslim League. Uh, but despite these announcements that there was going to be cooperation, and Nawaz Sharif did call uh, Gilani, uh, 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 doesn't seem to have materialized. There hasn't been any practical cooperation. And in fact, the two sides have been blaming the flood on each other. Um, uh, they don't get along and, uh, and haven't been cooperating. And in fact, the, the Muslim League would very much like to unseat Zardari before 2013 when the next elections are going to be held. It hasn't found a way to do that and it maybe can't be done. Uh, but if, if they could find a way to use the floods to get rid of Zardari altogether, they would. Um, this is a BBC map uh, from late August, uh, which shows the full extent of the disaster. Uh, uh, the, uh, the dark blue, I think, is just like underwater, and the light blue is uh, partially underwater or waterlogged or affected. Uh, and... Um, and the serial disaster, having hit the northwest and having hit southern Punjab, now it comes after Sindh. And of course, Sindh is a heavily agricultural uh, province, uh, which is deeply dependent on the Indus Valley, uh, where a lot of people live along the river, and it came after them. Uh, and it, it wasn't that it rained a lot in Sindh, it, rain, it rained in the north, and it created these crests in the river. So the river was just very swollen, and it would come down, and, 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 and the levees would break, just as happened in New Orleans. So uh, there were levees alongside the, the Indus uh, that would break, and then the water would just spill out into the fields, and the villages, and even the towns and cities. So uh, 
uh, one after another, you, there was announcements that such and such district would be evacuated, and that district would be evacuated, and this district would, and each of these were like 750,000 people, so it's like millions of people being moved out of their homes and, and uh, in expectation that the homes would soon be underwater. Uh, and in, in some instances, it, it did happen. The uh, city of Sajawa, which is population about 250,000, uh, as late as August 31st, a major city was inundated. This was not mentioned uh, in U.S. television news. Just past, I mean, this is a city almost as large as New Orleans, and, and it was underwater, uh, and it wasn't mentioned. And, and the interesting thing is, last week, and until Tuesday, further villages, 28 villages a day, were being inundated in Sindh, and this was not news. Uh, this is Butchell in Sindh on August 19th. So let me play a little, little bit of a clip. Now there are local politics about all this. Rain, that rain that flooded large parts of Sindh province, but the flood waters that surged down the Indus River from the north. The waters took more than two weeks to reach this region, and for some, nature was not to blame for most of the devastation. <laughs> For many years, influential people illegally encroached on the land by the Indus. No one stopped them. The river used to be much wider. That's why the water overflowed and caused all the destruction. That wasn't the only reason. This long-time agriculturalist explains major damage could have been avoided if the Ali Wahan dike was breached. Most of the floodwaters would have then been diverted to desert areas on the left bank of the river Indus, preventing the inundation of hundreds of villages on the other side. Many of the displaced here are from Jacobat district and areas in the upper Sindh region and many of them will tell you they believe their homes could have been spared from the floods. They allege politicians and landlords deliberately breached embankments to save their own land. The breach at the Tori Barrage in northern Sindh is believed to have caused much of the destruction in this province and in areas of neighboring Baluchistan. Some local politicians accuse the authorities of deliberately constructing barriers to divert the water for self-interest. Since then, ministers have acquired land there. They've set up big farms, they've built palaces there. So instead of sending the water in that direction where it will cause minimum damage, in order to save their own properties and land, they have drowned out the rest of them. Yeah, this is a very widespread uh, uh, theory uh, that one meets with among uh, the Pakistani public that the flooding in Sindh was uh, done deliberately by the Vaderas to save their own properties. It is not a theory that makes any sense to me uh, because if it's being alleged that the, the water could have been sent into the desert where nobody lived instead, were there Vaderas that were really attached to their desert that they didn't want it flooded? I mean, obviously, in Sin, the, uh, it's a hacienda kind of system. There are these huge estates. So the lands that were being flooded were owned by Vaderas. Uh, and I, I, I can't understand the logic of what's being asserted. Uh, and I, th I, th I mean, it's obviously class politics. This is a peasant and, and middle class charge against the big landlords. Yes? Yeah, well, there are, there are, you know, big landlords who have land along the rivers that would have been affected, but the vast majority of the damage would have gone onto the, the desert. But let, let me just finish up, and then we'll, we'll take questions and discuss these things. Uh, it was also alleged, by the way, that the, the mil U.S. military base at Jacobabad uh, was saved from flooding by uh, diverting the waters onto the peasants. So that... Well, the U.S. military deployed its helicopters to help people, uh, and moreover, however, that $200 million that the U.S. has slotted for relief aid, I don't think they're going to get any credit for it because the flood was their fault. Um, uh, 
Then the Taliban, uh, seeing that the army was busy with other things, uh, the Pakistani Taliban began blowing up things. Um, they blew up things in uh, the Northwest, in the federally administrated tribal areas, and they also blew, th blew up things in Lahore and Quetta, especially Shiite uh, uh, processions and uh, uh, shrines and so forth. Um, well, by this week, by, by mid-September, uh, the poor performance of the Pakistani civilian government, the relatively much more efficient and effective intervention of the Pakistani military, uh, the, uh, the scandal around uh, uh, Zardari uh, and his shoe whacking and so forth, had raised real questions in the minds of Washington uh, elites uh, and, and in other uh, Western capitals as to whether Zardari's government could survive, whether uh, Ashfaq uh, Kiani might not see an opportunity here to come to power, uh, and there were many rumors that, uh, that there would be a coup. Uh, there were also, of course, uh, worries about the government falling because the parliamentary system, if you can't pass a vote of no confidence, the government would fall, there would be new elections. Um, it doesn't seem to be that, that the Pakistan People Party's uh, uh, allies, uh, which give it a, a majority in parliament, are deserting it. Uh, they're allied with the uh, Awami League in, in uh, uh, in the northwest uh, frontier, uh, and uh, then uh, uh, other small allies seem to be sticking with them. So it doesn't appear to be the case that the government is going to fall politically. Uh, and um, on the other hand, a coup can't be completely ruled out, given that there have been so many, uh, and uh, uh, it's almost cyclical. Uh, so uh, Richard Holbrook, who uh, is uh, uh, President Obama's special envoy to Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, he'd widely referred to in Islamabad as Viceroy Holbrook, um, uh, came to Islamabad on September 15th and uh, uh, announced very loudly uh, and uh, tried to get it in the press that the Washington supports a civilian democratically elected government in Islamabad. There'd be no no mistake about, uh, about where Washington's uh, sentiments lie in this regard. And then uh, just on Thursday, uh, Yusuf Reza Gilani uh, said, uh, quote, we have come uh, to power through elections. We have the mandate. There is a coalition government and whatever is to happen, it would be through the parliament. Technocracy is not acceptable. So obviously he's afraid of a coup uh, and, uh, and the imposition of a technocratic unelected uh, cabinet. Uh, so to conclude, this flood played out on the political landscape of, of Pakistan, and it, it touched all of the political keystones of uh, Pakistan's uh, current crisis. Uh, the military, again, demonstrated that it's the one institution in Pakistan that kind of more or less works. Uh, it, the, part, the civilian parties were woefully unable to cooperate with one another, even in the face of this horrible disaster. And if you look at the statements of the parliamentarians and the politicians, it's really quite disgraceful the way they were just trying to use this for politics uh, rather than uh, intervening to help people. Uh, the international distrust of the Pakistani government uh, is so extreme that they've just had trouble even raising the immediate relief aid needed to help starving children to help families that are living on the highway because often it's the, the, the nice highway that's a little raised and people are don't, they, they're without tents. I mean, people are talking about how the refugees are in tent cities. I mean, a tent city is a luxury. Only 1.5 million of the 8 million displaced even have been provided with temporary shelter. Uh, there, uh, 5,000 schools have been damaged. Another 8,000 are out of commission because refugees are living in them. Uh, so uh, the, the international distrust of corruption, international distrust of the Pakistani army's involvement with groups like uh, lashkar e taiba and Taliban have made Pakistan so disreputable, apparently, that uh, even, its, uh, uh, even its refugees uh, suffer from that reputation. Uh, there have been uh, the, 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 the insurgents, the, the, the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan, have, have also played politics. On the one side, they've tried to organize relief so as to get 
uh, credit from the people and attract loyalty away from the central government. On the other hand, they have taken advantage of the ways in which the military is now busy with other things to attempt to disrupt urban life in Lahore and Quetta and elsewhere. Uh, and then, you know, Pakistan is among the more unequal, unequal societies in the world. Uh, there has never been proper land reform in either Pakistan or Bangladesh. Uh, the, uh, a third of the uh, country lives on less than a dollar a day. Uh, the peasants are virtually powerless. Unlike in India, there is no peasants party uh, and, uh, uh, or no effective one. Uh, and the government consistently intervenes on behalf of the big landlords to put down any peasant uprisings. And so uh, the, the, the flood is now being reworked in, uh, in the terms of class uh, discourse so that uh, Sindh was not inundated by a natural disaster, but rather by the landlord class. Uh, and since President Zardari is from the Sindhi landlord class, uh, I don't think that this uh, speaks well to his political future. So um, I will leave it there and uh, turn to, to questions. Thank you very much.